Yeah, no, good to see you out there today. Did, uh, did worship sound all right today? Uh, we, we, had blown, we had blown one of our subwoofers, and uh, right now is just not the best time to try to be purchasing something like that. So I contacted a company and asked if we could demo some speakers out, and me and the vice president of the company hit it off so well that he let us borrow the speakers until the end of the year. So... We're, we've been playing. We've been playing with them. They're uh, they're loud. They're really really loud. So anyway, we got some new subs. We got some line array speakers we're trying out. But that's if you notice the difference in the sound, that's why it was a little bit different today. Again, just a reminder: Christmas Eve, uh, the December twenty fourth, we will have two services. 3 p.m. and 5 p.m. We are trying earlier services this year uh, just to see how the response is and the turnout is. Uh, if it doesn't work for us, then we can look at possibly next year trying them a little bit later. We just know that as a team, our 8 o'clock service was like not very well attended and we were tired by the end of the night. So uh, we'll try it out. Please support Christmas Eve service. Like, let us not be the only ones up here doing Christmas Eve service and you're all sitting home sipping hot chocolate. We'd like to do that too, all right? Um, we had this really big struggle, like are we gonna just go online or will we have in person? And my belief is if we're not shut down, we're having live service for those that wanna come. And so that is our plan, all right? So my mom and dad, they moved to, uh, and, and my mom did text me earlier and said it was okay that I said all this. After I said it first service, she watched. My mom and dad, they moved to Tennessee uh, during this pandemic. And I gotta admit, I'm really missing my mom's Christmas cookies right now. Yeah. <laughs> my mom made the best Christmas cookies. She has some kind of special sauce that she put in those cookies. She didn't make them according to the package. And uh, anyway, my favorite one is the dainty log. And I'm not asking anybody to make me dainty logs. Wink, wink. Um, but a dainty log is a chocolate chip cookie dipped in chocolate and then dipped in pecan. It's just amazing. It's like, it's wicked awesome. Um, but I'm missing them right now. You know, my, I'm missing those Christmas cookies right now. That's one of my favorite parts of the season. But as great as a baker that my mom was, she could bake cookies and cakes and pies. She would not brag about her cooking. Right? Cooking and baking, two different things. Two different things. Uh, we were more of a meat and potatoes kind of family. And my mom had two seasonings that she would put in our food growing up, salt and pepper. That's it. That's all we really knew about. We only knew about salt and pepper. And we love salt. We love some salt. I mean, we would put a lot of salt on stuff. Like, my mom would take a tomato and cut it like an apple, put salt on and eat it straight. Right? I mean, that's, she loved her some salt. But it wasn't until I started dating this young Hispanic girl named Cynthia, who would later become my wife, that I went over her house for dinner one day, and oh my God, my taste buds just were on fire. Right, we ate meat and potatoes, we never ate rice. We never ate rice growing up, one, because my mom didn't know how to cook it. And if we did have rice, it was an Uncle Ben's microwave pouch. That's how she made rice. Nobody told us you have to have a special pot to do it the right way, like this, that metal looking thing. I show up to this house, and she got rice, but it's orange. <laughs> and it got beans in it. Yo! I was like, what's in this? Give me some more of this. And then she made a pork chop, but it wasn't like white people pork chop. <laughs> you know, white people pork chop nasty, but hers was like... <laughs> Her pork chop was orange and it was like deep fried and they called it chuleta. <laughs> the only downfall of my mother-in-law's cooking is the first day I ate there, I should not have opened my mouth, but I said, Mrs. Serrano, this food is amazing, but where's the vegetables? In my house, we had two vegetables at every dinner. That was a well-rounded meal. 
And I didn't realize that I was about to invoke the wrath of a Hispanic mom when she snapped her neck and looked at me and said, I gave you beans. <laughs> True story. That actually happened. And mom, if you're listening and watching today, beans are not a vegetable. They're a starch. Maybe we could pull a protein out of that. But it wasn't until I had dinner at the Serrano household that I realized how bland the food I was raised on was. I mean, they had seasonings that were the trifecta seasoning, like adobo. Adobo is like the mystery trifecta, salt, garlic powder, and pepper in one, right? It's just, whoa, this thing's amazing. Anyway, have you ever had a season of your life that just felt bland? Have you ever gone through a time in your life that felt emotionally bland? Have you ever gone through a season in your life where maybe it felt bland from the presence of God? Maybe you wanted to read your Bible but had no energy to do it. You wanted to pray, but every time you started to pray, your mind got distracted and you just didn't. Maybe you found yourself in a season of life where you just didn't care and you wanted to do bad stuff. You wanted to live a life that was emotionally broken, self-destructive. Maybe you found yourself in a drunken stupor multiple times. Maybe you, maybe you uh, had a surgery and were prescribed some painkillers. And when the pain had subsided, you still kept taking what was left of the prescription just because it felt so good. Come on, somebody. We're in church, but this ain't no normal church, all right? We'll get real in here. Maybe you found yourself in a bland season of life. Today, I want to talk twofold. You get, I'm, I'm, I'm playing here between two ideas of season, all right? Seasoning and a season of time. Bland tasting and bland feeling. Bland spiritually, bland emotionally. And I want to talk to you today about a passage of Scripture that's very popular. And I want to do something a little bit different. I want everybody to read it out loud with me as we go through Psalm 23. You ready? Psalm 23 says this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He make me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Selah. That's it. That's the whole Psalm 23. It's a great passage. It's one of those things that you could remind yourself of if you find yourself in a bland season of life. But I want to go through this and break it down a little bit because I got some questions. I got some questions, David, about this, okay? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. But wonder if I find myself in a season of want. Is God not my shepherd? Let me throw this out there. This is the season of gift giving, but gift giving is kind of backwards. Gift giving is a little bit backwards, okay? So my wife comes to me, she says, what do you want for Christmas? Well, I don't want anything. But then she gives me a magazine or she gives me an internet link, makes me start looking at stuff, and then I realize there's some stuff that I don't have that I now want. I didn't want it. Until you showed it to me. <laughs> Come on, I didn't want no orange rice until I tasted me some orange rice. I didn't want no arroz con pollo until I had some arroz con pollo. I didn't want no penil and chuleta until I had me some penil. 
Come on, somebody. Huh? I didn't want no beans. I didn't want no abitrella until I had it. Now I want it. And I want it every day. I was okay with the 55-inch TV until she sent me a link to Best Buy. And they got the 80-inch on sale. And it'll fit in the same spot. And it ain't just LED, it's now QLED. It now has yellow added to it. It's now 4K <laughs> instead of just HD. Come on, somebody. I wasn't in want until I was shown. Oh, no, 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 no. You're going to want this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, but wonder if I find myself in a season of want. Then is he not my shepherd? Am I doing something wrong? You see, the, 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 the deal is, and when we're looking at a scripture like this, we, we're not the ones that get to define the want. We think we are. <laughs> Listen, the word want really means need. The Lord is my shepherd, I will not be in need. That the Lord is my shepherd, he will take care of my necessities. The Lord is my shepherd, he will keep me, protect me, and comfort me. So I will not need or want of those things. What happens is we live way above our means. We live above our paychecks. We want things outside of our own financial scope. That's why we got credit cards and rack up the debt. That's why they got layaway. <laughs> I'm sorry. It don't mean that he's not your shepherd. It just means that we're trying to define our want by some other standards. Come on, Philippians 4.19. And my God shall supply all of my needs according to... Let me just tell you, my dad flosses. My king, my dad, my God, he flosses. Know what that means? Not his teeth. Like, the Bible says that heaven is paved with streets of gold. I mean, you might have a little gold in your teeth, but he's, paved, he's paving streets. We go, he's not using asphalt. He's not using tar and chip. He's not using gravel. He's paving streets with gold. So when he says, my God shall supply all of my needs, not according to my want, but according to his riches and glory. Amen. We got to understand what the need is. What's my need in this moment? Listen, honestly, I don't need a TV. TV just distracts me from reading books, right? That, that's, not, that's not the need. But anyway, we could go on and on on that one. Really, I want to look at the other two, two other verses in here. Verse two, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. I got a problem with this. Why I got to lay down? Why can't he make me to stand tall? Why can't he make me to stand strong? Why can't we go skipping through the field in the pasture? Why we gotta be laying down in the pasture? And I have to understand that it's because he wants us to rest. He wants us to bring us to a place of peace. He's gonna bring me to green pastures to lie down and rest and lead me beside still water. Still waters is this perfect idea of peace. It's a still water. There's nothing harder being out fishing on a lake when it's windy and you're fighting the wind the whole day to keep the boat where you want. But when the water's calm, when there's a still water, there's such a peace that comes. But that's not the point that bothers me. The part that bothers me is he makes me lay down in green pastures. I never liked that nobody make me do nothing. I never liked nobody make me do nothing. I mean, it's okay you ask me to do something. It's okay you strongly urge me, but make me? You ever play that game Mercy? Where you grab, interlock people's fingers and you flip them this way and you try to outstrength somebody and bend their wrist back and make them say mercy and, and, and give in? I promise you this, you will break both my wrists. <laughs> I will never, I never cry mercy. You will break both my arms and take them off before I say out of my mouth, mercy. I'm telling you straight out, I don't like people trying to make me do something. 
But God says, make me lay down in green pasture. Did you know the hardest trick to train your pet is to lay down? You get him to sit, you get him to shake hands, just simply by treats. But to get an animal to lay down on command is the hardest because it takes total surrender. It takes total submission for that animal in and of its own will to lay down at your command. See, what God wants to do in our lives is say, just give me total surrender. Give me total submission and I will bring you peace like still waters that would surpass all understanding. If you would just give yourself unto me, I would lead you down paths that are full of peace. Then he goes on to say, he restores my soul. Some of us could use a little soul restoration. Our souls can grow weary. Our souls can get a little dingy, a little rusty, right? He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Wait! How do we get to the valley of the shadow of death? We were laying down in green pastures. We were skipping by still waters. We were on paths of righteousness and restoring of souls. Now I'm in the valley of the shadow of death. How we get here? How we get here? How did I get from paths of righteousness to valleys of death? Let's look at something. Let's look at this, okay? Verse 2 says, he makes me lay down. Verse 2 says, he leads me by still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me down paths of righteousness. He, he, he. And it says, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He didn't lead me here. He didn't put me here. He was leading me down paths of righteousness, and I'm like, yeah, but yo, did you see this over here? <laughs> He's leading me down here, but yo, they got 80 inch TV over here. <laughs> Credit card ching. Like, He's leading me down the paths of righteousness, yea, though I walk. Through the valley of the shadow of death. It don't say that he put me there. It don't say that he's leading me there. It didn't say that he took me. It says, I went there. Now, again, there's some stuff that you've done that you done. You made that decision. You chose to do that thing. But there's also other circumstances in life that you didn't choose but yet you still find yourself in the valley of the shadow of death. I kind of say right now, we kind of in a valley of the shadow of death, nine months of it. I didn't do this. I didn't make no virus. This ain't my fault, right? But I'm having to deal with it. I'm having to go through it. But you know what I love? It says, however you got there, because we don't know how we got there. We were on paths of righteousness, but now I find myself in a valley of the shadow of death. However I got there, it says this, thou art with me. Listen, if you ever have been taught, if you've ever been taught that God is with you and then you mess up and God says, whoa, I can't be by that. Father, will you forgive me? Oh, I can come back to you now. You mess up, oh, I got to go back over here. <laughs> Father, forgive me. Oh, okay, I can come back. How exhausting. Yeah. How exhausting. God is not that fickle. That's right. His emotions are not moved by your behavior. Do you know why he dealt with the sin problem on the cross? So he would never leave you or forsake you. So he never had to walk away from you. That's why he dealt with sin on the cross. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? Why don't I have to fear evil? Although, listen, oh my God, even if I did this myself, I put myself in this position, I don't have to fear because thou art with me. Watch what he says. Your rod and your staff. 
they protect me. That's why he says it brings comfort. Because he's standing there ready with a rod and a staff ready to boom bash anybody who's trying to rise up on me. We'd understand this better if we knew that there was a valley, a literal valley called the shadow of death in Israel. The valley called the shadow of death runs parallel to the Jordan River to the south of Jericho in the Judean hills in an area more commonly referred to as the Judean desert or the wilderness. It could reach temperatures well above 104 degrees during its long summer months. And so because of its extreme climate and and dangerous terrain, we believe that's why it was called this valley of the shadow of death. It was dangerous to travelers. And a lot of times, people would seek out that path as a shortcut. Shortcuts in life. Shortcuts in life could be dangerous, y'all. They would use this as a shortcut to get to their other side of their destination. But this valley of the shadow of death also had this name because the only time of the day that it was lit was when the sun was directly over top of it. Otherwise, any angle, there was these pockets of shadows. Robbers, thieves, murderers would hide in these shadows, in these caves, in these cliffs inside of this valley. And someone who would find themselves wandering in this valley of the shadow of death many times would be robbed or killed. However you found yourself in your valley, whether you wandered off Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Maybe you're trying to take a shortcut in life. Maybe you're trying to take a shortcut at work. Find yourself in trouble. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Now watch this. However we found ourselves in that valley, maybe there was a robber in there trying to come against me, Look what it says in verse 5. Same, same, same passage. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Not only did you boom bash my enemy, but then you fed me a buffet in front of them just to show how blessed I am. You anointed my head with oil and you kept filling that cup to overflowing. It's saying, yeah, you've had bland seasons of life. There's been seasons that you've walked through bad stuff, but if you really look back at it, God was in it with you. You anoint me with oil. I believe the most anointed people are people who've been through some stuff in life. The most anointed people, in my opinion, are people who've been through some stuff. Got some dirt on you got some history, got some background, got some big mistakes. And I just wonder if you sprinkle a little Jesus on the bland seasons of your life, if you sprinkled a little Jesus into those moments that that, that, that maybe should have took you out, if God couldn't use those situations for for his glory, for his good, we're going to get to that. Let me tell you a story today. I'm, I'm going to give you a lot of information. I'm going to bring it back together at the end. There's a young man named Joseph. Joseph was one of 12 brothers. He was the favored son of his dad, Jacob. His dad, Jacob, made him a coat of many colors. Ever heard this story before? Joseph has a dream that his brothers one day would bow down to him as, as, as their king, as their ruler. And young man just had to go run his mouth. Little cocky kid. Got to go run his mouth, go tell his brothers, y'all, I had a dream. Guess what? Y'all going to bow down to me. And they made those boys upset. We're never going to bow down to you. In fact, they hated him because he was the favorite son. Joseph should have just kept his mouth shut. But then he has another dream. Same kind of dream. This time his mom and dad bowing down too. So he goes and he, uh, um, he goes and tells them all this. Now they plot to kill him. They're going to kill him. But his one brother, Reuben, stands up and says, hey, let's not kill him. He's our brother. So they throw him in a pit. 
and, and merchants come by. Let's see what happens. In Genesis 37, 28. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the cistern. That's like a pit that they used to collect water and sold him for 20 shekels of silver. 200 bucks today. $200 in today's standard. And they took him to Egypt. Verse 36. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar. So the brother sold him to the Midianites. The Midianites sold him to Potiphar in Egypt. And Potiphar was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Now, we don't hear about Joseph again until chapter 39. A whole bunch of stuff happens. But chapter 39, he's in a bad situation, right? He's ripped from his home just because he bragged about a dream. So, yeah, if he kept his mouth shut, he probably would have been all right. But his brothers hated him anyway. Now he's in a system. Now he's being sold. He's being abused. He's being pushed around out of his control. Verse 39, check this out. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. He sold, but he begins to prosper still in the valley because God is with him. And he lived in the house of the Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, he promoted him. He actually put him over his entire house. He said, run my house for me. So he's in the valley of the shadow of death. He's in a bad situation, but God is with him. And because God is with him, he keeps getting prospered and promoted. But the story doesn't end there. Potiphar's wife thought he was kind of cute. Had a little thing for him. So one day, Potiphar's wife calls her, calls him to her room. She tries to put the moves on him. And he is like, yo, back up, right? He, he rejects her. And so as he runs away from her, she grabs his cloak, pulls it off, and he takes off running. Now, she's kind of salty about this. She's kind of upset that she got rejected. So hubby comes home and she makes up this whole story. You know that young man that you brought into our house? He tried to make the moves on me. Look, I've got his coat. So Potiphar comes home. Boom. He puts him in prison for something he didn't do. For being a stand-up guy. For being a just guy. He gets thrown in prison. Genesis 39, 20. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, guess what? The Lord was with him. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. The Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put him in charge of all the prisoners. <laughs> Prisoner in charge of prisoners. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with him and gave him success in whatever he did. No matter how he got in this situation, everything he did was blessed. Oh my God. Tell me... Tell me right now, tell me right now, you ain't never found yourself in a position that you should not have been in. Next thing you know, you find yourself witnessing to somebody. It's happened to me a lot. You're sitting there trying to tell somebody about Jesus and you're you, you tacking on the third Corona light. Come on, somebody. I'm just throwing this out there, all right? I'm being for real up in here. You know you, you, know you should have stopped at .25 of one. Should have had a little taste, a little sample. And you're six deep. Let me tell you about Jesus. <laughs> it, listen, I'm not giving nobody a pass on no behavior. All I'm saying is you can't wander from the foot of the cross. 
He will track you down. He will chase you down. He is with me. I can't run fast enough to get away from him. (laughs) So he's in prison. He interprets a dream for the Pharaoh. This is the king. He interprets a dream for Pharaoh. Watch this, Genesis 41. Man, we started back in 36. Genesis 41, and Pharaoh said to him, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace. He's still a prisoner in charge of the palace. And all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Yo, he's still in the valley. See, the problem is we've been focusing in our own personal lives too much on the valley instead of the valor. We've been focused on the problem instead of the provider. We've been focusing on our situation and not the savior. It's okay, you might be in it, but you can prosper in the midst of it. Remember Joseph's dream? It happens. The land goes through famine. His brothers have to come to ask for food. Genesis 50, verse 19. And Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. They don't even know it's Joseph. At first, they don't even know it's him. Once they find out, they think, oh my God, he's gonna kill us because this guy's powerful. He says, we're in a place of God. But as for you, what you meant for evil against me, God's gonna use for his good. God's got a different definition on what you meant for me. You meant to harm me, you meant to do evil to me, but God is taking what you meant and he's placing a new definition on it. And he's blessing me even in the midst of your evil deeds. Come on, somebody. God defines the blessing, God defines the need. God wants to use what the enemy meant for evil as an avenue for blessing in your life. We're in this series called Christmas. I need more Jesus. No, you don't. You need to recognize the fact that he is with you. Here's what I learned about adobo. Adobo, that trifecta, salt, garlic powder, and pepper. It's good in measure, but you use too much, That junk's nasty. Let me tell you what I did. I fell in love with adobo so bad that I was making breakfast one day. And I was like, man, I'm gonna add some of that adobo to my eggs. So I mixed up some eggs, ah, bah, bah, and like emerald, bam! Hit up, bam, bam! I hit a double tap of of the adobo, bah, bah, on the eggs, cooked them up, Caught, caught me back right there in that saliva gland right there. Saliva just come out of my mouth. It just It was just too much. Too much. Too much. <laughs> too much, man. It was like, oh. Because just it was just a little is all I needed. It's a little, I already had it. I already had the seasonings there, man. I still even had the bacon grease in there. So like the bacon grease was enough. We got this idea sometimes that we got to add more Jesus, more Jesus, more Jesus. What you need to do is say, he is with me. You are with me. Even when you don't feel him, remind yourself, you are with me with me, even when you don't want to, even when you want to blame him for the situation you're in, you are, listen, listen, just straight out. I'm real with God. Me and God, we, we for real, all right? If I'm upset at him about something, I'll straight up be like, yo, 
I feel like this is your fault. So get me out of this. Huh? Let me just straight out. Can I, can I be for real? I had a little breakdown with this whole COVID thing. I had a little breakdown one day. And I was starting to sweat. I was starting to bug out about church and leading church the right way. And I looked straight at God and I said, yo, you called me. I didn't ask for this job. I didn't want this job. In fact, I'm pretty sure I said no like 12 times. I'm pretty sure I quit three times. I was fired seven. Huh, Cindy? That's for real, right? Yeah, I was fired seven times. I didn't ask for this. You put me here. So you know what? You fix this. Oh my God, you talk to God that way? He understands. He's a big boy. He understands. He told me to shut up. (laughs) He's for real with me too. It don't matter where you find yourself, how you got yourself there, whatever, any mood you're in about it, remind yourself, you are with me. I know I got myself in this mess, but since you're here with me, let's figure this out. I believe that your rod and your staff, they will comfort me. And you know the funny part about it? is when he does rescue me out of those situations and he does reaffirm me in those moments, you know what I want to do? See if the cameras can keep up with me. You know what I want to do? I want to run back to that pasture. I'm laying down. I'm laying down. I'm laying down. I'm laying down. I surrender. Ow. (laughs) I didn't want to do it at first. I didn't want to do it at first. I'll lay down. I'll lay down. Hey, Father, we thank you today that your word will never return void, but it will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for being our comforter, our guide, our lead. Take us down those paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Lead us and guide us by the word that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Lord, I lift up anybody in here today who's going through a time, either a physical ailment or emotional time, God, that you would strengthen them during this season, that you would bring hope into their valley of the shadow of death, that it would just be a passing shadow. God, I pray that you shine the light of your spirit on that dark situation and let the heat of your glory just burn that thing up in the name of Jesus. We thank you as we leave here today that we are blessed. Everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you. Have a great weekend.